Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to week four. Thank you for joining. I guess we have a couple of minutes more. Uh, we'll wait for everyone else to join and then we'll uh, start. But thank you for joining and excited to start the session today. Let me know if you guys can hear me clearly. And Great, thank you. It's almost time. It's I am in the Eastern Standard Time Zone, so it's almost three o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna wait a couple more minutes, and then we can start. And thank you. Thank you for joining. Great, I guess uh, we're gonna kick off the session today. Uh, thank you for joining, welcome to week four. I uh, hope you guys uh, were able to review the slides from the previous week uh, and uh, maybe tried out some of the code that we shared from the notebooks. Uh, if not, then uh, no need to worry, the recordings are already available in the link and Hel Helena will share the link uh, to that as well. Uh, also, if you're joining the series for the first time uh, in this session, don't have to worry about it at all because you can just go through, we will recap some of the things we discussed last week and uh, you can refer to them uh, in, via the recordings and the notebooks uh, later at your own pace. So yeah, uh, uh, thank you again for joining and uh, we'll start. So uh, before uh, we start, uh, like I really want to give a big shout out to the amazing team of vol volunteers that like put together this whole series. Uh, the series wouldn't have been uh, possible without a huge amount of contribution from each of them. Uh, for this session, uh, I uh, my name is Jaita. I'll be the speaker, and all the other leaders will be present uh, on chat to support you. So please feel free to ask any questions that you may have, and uh, they will uh, answer it in the Q and A section. Also, uh, a big shout out to our sponsor, Home Depot, for putting together uh, this much needed event for the uh, community. Please do show your appreciation by retweeting our post. So Helena is going to share uh, a post link uh, on the chat section. Please, if, you, if you are active on Twitter, uh, please go and uh, share it and show your support for them. Uh, thank you. Great, uh, so uh, you can download the slides. Uh, the link will be shared in the chat section. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask it in the Q&A box and one of the uh, panelists will definitely answer uh, the question. I'll also be taking some uh, questions at the end of the session. So uh, feel free to ask if you have uh, any. Also, if you have any issues uh, accessing any of the notebook or the slides, please uh, mention it in the chat section and Helena and the other uh, panelists will be able to uh, help you out with that. Also, don't forget to follow us uh, in the LinkedIn and also join our Slack channel. In that way, we can answer all your questions later on as well. Uh, great, so this is the uh, fourth week I'm so excited we have come a long way. This is almost halfway through our series. And today's session is going to be the third deep dive session. The agenda for uh, today, uh, we're going to take a quick look, uh, recap from week three. We're going to look at what is text vectorization, word embeddings. We'll go over some of the uh, use cases of word to vec Stanford Glove models. 
these are all what embedding models. Uh, we'll also run through some of the use cases in a high level, which is like doc similarity, uh, question answering, and also information retrieval. Uh, we'll slightly cover the uh, overview of what is BERT and the state of NLP today, uh, so that you have like you know a baseline understanding of how it's structured, and then you can go from there and you know, start uh, learning a little deeper in each of these segments. And at the end of it, we will implement it in the Google Colab notebook in the second session uh, section of the series. Great. So uh, for the recap of week three, these were some of the uh, concepts that we uh, did an overview on in the last week. So what is TFIDF? Uh, so TFIDF stands for uh, Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. Uh, this is like a combination of two metrics and uh, one is the term frequency and other is the inverse term frequency, document frequency. Uh, this technique uh, was kind of developed for ranking results for queries and search engines. And now it's like a really important model in all of the information uh, retrieval use cases in NLP. Uh, some of the applications you would see that uh, TFIDF was like kind of invented where for like document search and it can deliver results that's like really important uh, in all the use cases we see today. So imagine if you have like a, a search engine and you want to look up about any personality, say Kobe Bryant, the results will be displayed in order of relevance. So how does it do it? The, it does it by like quoting the relevant sports articles that those are given higher ranks because TFIDF give, gives the word uh, Kobe Bryant a higher score since it's much, uh, since that's what you searched for. So it's also uh, used in different kinds of uh, other use cases. So here in the chart, you see that uh, the overall idea is to map rare words and give them a high value of importance. And uh, based on the occurrences, the, the y-axis talks about how, how much it has occurred in the documents. Is it low or high? And the x-axis, it is the value or the score of importance uh, in the documents. So if it's a rare word, then the occurrences would be lower and the value of its importance is higher. But if it's like stop words and frequent words, then their occurrences are much higher compared to rare words and their value in terms of uh, in terms of how it's scored by TFIDF is, uh, is lower. You can also uh, review some of the uh, recordings from last week to get like you know, a detailed uh, explanation for that as well. For a quick recap of uh, bag of words. So bag of words is like a common feature extraction procedure for sentences and documents. Uh, it's called a bag of words because like any information about the order or structure of the words is discarded. It does not uh, keep all those nuances while doing the uh, tokenization. So this model is only concerned to know whether a word has occurred in the document or not. It doesn't uh, keep the flow of the words. Then we also looked at document similarity. This is a kind of a process of using a distance or similarity based metrics so that you can you know, identify how similar a text document is. and. Uh, in respect you know, to other documents that's based on like similar features that were extracted from the documents using uh, maybe uh, words, uh, what we discussed, like maybe bag of words or TFIDF, et cetera. Great. So today we're gonna start up and take a look at embeddings in specific uh, and how we do that. So before we uh, jump into that, let's quickly review about what word vectorization is. So we saw in some of the uh, series, first, second, and even third, that vectorization is just the process of converting text into numerical representation, right? So it, while processing natural language text, we need to extract like useful information from all the given words and sentences. And this requires that the string needs to be converted into a set of real numbers or vectors. So all the applications of uh, NLP, like text mining, uh, topic detection, sentiment analysis, they all kind of need the words to be transferred into numbers. And then the sequence of words into another sequence of numbers so that we know which word comes next to each other. We'll look at it uh, in a much deeper insight as we go forward. So once we know those numbers, now the uh, algorithm comes into play and help us in classifying and clustering. So 
one thing we need to note about text encoding is that there are a few techniques available like we discussed last week as well on how we can do but each one of those techniques have like you know a pro and a con so we need to see which is best suitable for you know our particular task at hand so the simplest encoding technique do not retain word order like we saw for a bag of word model but some others do some encoding techniques are very fast and intuitive but the size of the resulting document vectors may uh, like not be uh, very useful in in order to like apply it in a hands on basis at all time so uh, so what is word embedding so from that concept of uh, you know the the thing that we just discussed here in word vectorization we can basically explain word embedding as like a collective name for a set of language models and feature learning techniques here uh, the words and the phrases are like mapped to the vectors together not necessarily as one particular token like we saw in tfidf which we are only doing it word by word and not necessarily phrases at once so this kind of keeps some of the uh, context in the process flow of creating the tokenization, which bag of word and TFIDF were not able to do it. Uh, so here conceptually it involves like a mathematical embedding from a space and all the dimensions of a particular word would be mapped into a vector space. Uh, we will look at what vector space is in like just next few slides. So uh, how can we do it or how the methods can be included? So you, there are multiple ways uh, in how these embeddings can be done. Neural networks, dimensionality reduction, and probability models are some of the base uh, use cases of how we can do it. Uh, another thing on why we do uh, word embeddings is, is to keep that context, right? So some of the word and phrase embeddings, when we use it as like the underlying input representation, that that's like you are you're, you're trying to boost the performance of an NLP task, right? Like say a syntactic parsing, like we saw in week two, and sentiment analysis. So if we do not understand the context, sometimes it becomes very vague to just class a, a word uh, just by the uh, name of it and without knowing the underlying uh, meaning of it. So to go forward, this is what a vector space looks like. It's basically all the embeddings that we have from our data or for, from the corpus that you are passing. Corpus is nothing but just a, you know, a, a summation of all the data strings that you have, the data documents that you have, uh, and that makes up the vector space model. So it's, it's just a statistical representation to show or to help the computer or the algorithm understand that uh, how many documents contain a particular term, right? Like that, that the overall idea, we, we would also need the frequency, the importance, which word comes next to each other, all those are kinds of features. And that gets mapped for each of the word in uh, the vector space. So uh, yeah, like I said, what are the important terms each document has? What What is the dimensions of it? Like say, if you have a vocabulary size of 105, and not necessarily all of them is a something that you really uh, want. And out of that, 500 can be the distinct word. So you can choose and uh, create your vector space as per your own document set that you have so that you, you can like train it for custom and your uh, custom solutions that you may want to build. It also like uh, keeps all the features for the lexicon of the document, what are the word correlations uh, with each other and etc. Great. So with that in mind of what word embedding is and what is a vector space, we are going to look at word to vec. So as the name suggests, it's like the transformation of a word to a vector, but in a much, much broader and uh, I would say detailed way so that uh, it keeps the context as well as the uh, semantics of the whole syntactic structure uh, and preserves that uh, whole idea of a sentence and the meaning that the sentence is trying to convey. So this idea is uh, in, was introduced in 2013 by Google. So what word vectors is like, they are built on this fundamental idea is that, that you shall know a word by the company it keeps, right? Like uh, how do we define or how do we know that what word means? We know it by the uh, context that it has been used in. So basically, if you have a large corpus, uh, you can make a data, data set with like, you know, a 
tuple uh, tuple where you can like each tuple will have like a one word which is like an x say and uh, another word uh, which is like maybe say y that's like in context of the first word so basically uh, if you say that uh, my name uh, so my and name will be X and Y. And you would say that when you talk about name, you also talk about my as a word when you are uh, saying a particular sentence. So then the machine learning or the, uh, you know, the NLP architecture will learn from this predicted words and say that, okay, if you have a given context word of X, Y is the next word. So that's like, you know, prediction based. So the general assumption, like I mentioned in word to vec is that words that occur in similar contexts tend to have like similar meanings and falls in a similar uh, area in the whole vector space of your documents. So yeah, the baseline pre-trained uh, word to vec model uh, has like 300 dimensions and it was trained uh, on 3 million unique words from Google News data uh, that's in the training corpus. So it's pretty big and we will utilize this model in the hands-on section uh, in the later part of the session uh, and see how we can leverage all the already pre-trained model into doing some uh, pretty cool uh, stuff with uh, our data. Great, uh, so as I mentioned in what to where context matters. So uh, look at this example. This is the type one uh, type of similarity like one, it's called the semantic relatedness. The definition is like some relations are between words, right? Like when you talk about truck, what comes to your mind first? The word road is very similar because truck like goes in the road and it doesn't fly. So those are words that are semantically related. Uh, also, when, you, when we think about B, the first thing that comes to our mind is honey. So that's because we know that these are some of the uh, concepts that are interrelated and uh, are connected with each other. The second type of similarity is also called a semantic similarity. So here, uh, you know, some of the words, uh, we can use it in the same way or maybe uh, uh, to some portion interchangeably. Like when you talk about car, you can also talk about cars like, you know, automobile or auto part or an automotive, uh, something like that. And also like when you talk about a doctor, you can also refer to a doctor as surgeon, like not necessarily, I understand in all the cases, but it's kind of talk, you get the meaning out of it and it can sometimes be used uh, interchangeably. Great. Uh, so we'll go uh, forward and see and look at what actual definition of uh, what to make is like uh, i know the image of the left hand side looks a little daunting but take it step by step we see that there are three layers it has an input layer a hidden layer and there's an output layer so basically uh, the what to make vec is like a shallow feed forward neural network it has only single hidden layer so that's why we call it shallow because it's not deep and what we are doing with it is like each word is represented by a vector you see the array of the uh, numbers that's based on the embeddings in the first input vector right that's going out once we do all the tokenization we do the word uh, you know uh, vectorization and then each word is now an input vector that goes into the uh, modular system I find this concept of embeddings like really fascinating because if you have seen uh, or, or have ever used, you know, Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, any of those Google Translate or even like you know, smartphone uh, keyboard that gives you a next word prediction, right? All the chances are like you have utilized this idea that has become uh, central to NLP, I would say, and building all the NLP models. So the development over the last couple of decades using embeddings uh, for neural networks have been huge. And we would see in, uh, some of these steps ahead, like how BERT and models like GPT-2 comes into play. Uh, and all the base ideas of all those big models is word to vec So it's like very crucial that we understand this baseline concept very clearly. And, uh, and from there, we can build up and utilize any any uh, bigger uh, models that comes into existence from all the big companies. So uh, yeah, so word to vec basically finds the relation, the semantic as well as uh, the syntactic between the words, which is kind of not possible by the traditional TF-IDF or the frequency-based approach because they do not retain the meaning of the uh, documents or the words that we pass it through them. 
uh, so basically transforms the unlabeled raw corpus into labeled data and maps it to the target word based on the context word. We will see how in some of the next steps. And it then learns the representation of words in a classification task, say like we know we want to classify some of the uh, documents that we have, if it's a sports article or if it's a, you know, a entertainment article, we can do that using a very, uh, uh, a model by uh, Wojtovec. Great. So, uh, what is the general process? So, uh, you say you have like you know tens of thousands of unique words in your text vocabulary, right? Sometimes uh, when you compute it with one hot encoded vectors, we discussed it in uh, week one as well as in week two. For some of these words, it's very inefficient because you know most of the values uh, will be of the one hot vector would be zero. Why? Because like when you pass a sentence, not necessarily that sentence is repeated multiple times in your whole document corpus and you might have unique words. And if they are unique, then it'll, it's most, when it's mostly uh, represented in the vector space, their value would be zero. So when you do the overall matrix calculation, that will happen that one vector, one hot vector and a first hidden layer, that multiplication will give you, you know, like zero value so that doesn't help our purpose so what we are uh, trying to do here is that we're trying to use the embeddings to solve this problem and improve the efficiency of the whole uh, network that we want to use it for all the classification tasks and all other nlp tasks so embeddings are like kind of a full connected layer and uh, we call this layer as embedding layer uh, as you see it's in, in the in the image uh, in the slide and you all, we also have the weights, it's called the embedding weights. So basically what we are trying to do is uh, the, when we train a model, each one hot uh, encoded word gets a point in the dimensional space where it learns and groups it itself together with similar meaning words. So basically we're clustering similar meaning words into the vector space so that we can refer back uh, when we, uh, when we, talk about it uh, later. So basically we're creating uh, embedding lookup layer here. In the next uh, example, like you see here, say we you say you have a uh, you have a word called say cool, and uh, that that word or that gets a matrix value of say 512. So that becomes the word's weight matrix and goes into in the weight matrix section as 512. So later when you want to look up. Uh, the word called cool, you don't have to go through the entire matrix. You just look up the whole embedded matrix, uh, weight matrix, and then call that uh, number out. So if you think about it, you are not doing the lookup at all. The, the whole uh, algorithm that runs or what to make internally is doing this, but it's very crucial that we understand the, uh, on how it is doing uh, since uh, if, if there needs to be any you know uh, changes or you need to uh, fine tune in any of the parameters you know exactly where to look or what to uh, update great so uh, yeah so some of the key points the embedding layer is just a hidden layer uh, it does you do not interact with it directly into the section the lookup table is just a weight matrix and the short it's just a shortcut for matrix multiplication because you're not doing it uh, all over it, but you are just keeping it in memory and then looking it up uh, from the model that it's already pre-trained uh, before. Great, so yeah, what if I like, kind of falls under the prediction-based embeddings, which says that we tend to predict a word given uh, the context in which it is uh, used. So let's look at some example here. So like say for example, uh, we have a uh, few words. The vector of the word, cat is very similar to the vector of the word dog, right? Because it kinds of fall in the same uh, domain. They, they are both animals, they are both good pets. So there are a lot of common points that binds them together contextually. But uh, the vector for pencil will be like kind of different from the vector from cat. Like, uh, yeah, they are uh, like some things that we have around, but they're not necessarily from the similar domain. So this similarity is defined by the you know, frequency of two words in question. That is how many times cat and dog or like cat and pencil have been used in the same context. So if say, say you have this example, like I like to pet my dash. 
and you have three options dog cat and pencil uh, which is the one you think the odd one out right like if you if as a humans we look at it very clearly uh, the pencil becomes odd one out uh, from the uh, all these three options that we have but why is the pencil odd one out the spelling is fine the grammar would also uh, you know keep up if we utilize i like to pet my pencil but uh, it still doesn't make sense because contextually the word pencil is not correct here this should convince uh, like in the training data the word to vec when it ran through your whole corpus it didn't find uh, a lot of co-occurrences of cat and pencil at all so it it's basically uh, doesn't feel that this is a right fit and which is correct right uh, it's not a right fit so yes yeah, so this is a great uh, the power of context is like a very important one in, in all the word or nlp algorithms we have uh, today because uh, the word algorithms use the context of words to learn all the numerical representations so that the words like you use are in the same context have similar looking word vectors and not like all over the place and uh, we can uh, utilize it correctly the another uh, another good example uh, use case here uh, i'm sure you'll see these diagrams all over when you do a little bit of reading uh, and think about it from this perspective like say when you have like you know a big you want to train a big unsupervised model and you feed it with like a lot of amount of text from like say wikipedia data news or articles or anything so these kind of representations to capture the semantic similarity what it does is uh, embeddings learn it in such a way that you can actually measure the distance between vectors for words with closed meanings like say in the in the example the first example where king and queen are closer uh, in the terms of distance of words uh, with com than like with different complete meanings like king and carpet it doesn't that doesn't make sense so we uh, talked about some of the uh, similarity uh, metrics last week as well right we'll talk about it a little bit more and see how word to vec helps us in uh, document similarity sentence similarity and how we can utilize that uh, later in the later part of the collab notebook session so these vectors basically are very good at uh, you know answering analogy questions uh, in the form of is like if a is to b and b is to c then uh, what is a is to c they can answer those kind of uh, questions as well uh, great uh, it, yeah so like it mentions here like if you you know utilize you do the mathematical operation on vectors as well utilizing word to vec and say that hey uh, uh, if you do king minus man but you also doing a plus when you say plus that means the positive reinforcement and we are saying that we want the word woman to be more given preference than man in terms of finding the uh, closer word to king uh, i'll repeat that once again so like when we are doing king minus man we are trying to find a similar uh, similar contextual word to king but we are giving a negative reaffirmation to the word man and giving a positive reaffirmation to the word woman so basically then the word to vec model will be able to find and give you a uh, queen as the resultant uh, value of that operation very fascinating you would also see that uh, if you have like you know a data set with country and capital values and uh, it runs and creates that linkage to saying that okay if it's spain it's madrid if it's italy it's rome and create that keep these names together in a cluster similar uh, similar space in the in the whole vector space model great uh, this is just to give you a visual idea about how it looks like in a 2d format this is in no way the actual format of all the dimensions because the dimensions are so big it won't we won't be able to plot it in that detail so this is just a 2d uh, but uh, visualization of uh, an embedding here you would see tsne tsne sne is basically t distributed stochastic neighbor embedding here is just visualizing which words are you know mapped together so can you guys like you know point or uh, like visual see some of the very uh, uh, grouped words yeah i see two here like i mentioned like say land soil ground and surface 
are like you know kind of uh, together uh, and mapped together in the vector space another area is heat electricity energy fuel oil so these words are kind of mapped uh, in in, uh, in in a similar space we would also you know run our data and see how those words are mapped uh, uh, use in the news article uh, the news article that we will use for the uh, collab session there's also a few others like fish eggs meat they all uh, belong together and coffee drink drugs are like very uh, clear uh, vector spaces great so yeah you can see that uh, vortivec is like you know used in all exciting uh, nlp frontiers that we have right now it's heavily used in topic modeling document similarity machine translations a lot of it is like the base of creating the chatbots uh, question answering methodology and recommendation engines uh, this this uh, cartoon is like very funny it gives you the expression of what it actually means it says that oh express so but i ordered for a cappuccino and the uh, um, bot says that oh don't worry the cosine distance between them is so small that it's almost the same thing and you see that at the head it says that in word check documentation cappuccino espresso tea and croissant are like all uh, in a similar vector space so yeah that gives you the whole feel of it of why it's so uh, useful in some of the use cases uh, we have mentioned here so just to quickly go over uh, uh, some of the architecture and how Vertivec is implemented. So it's implemented in two ways. You have a common bag of words and you have Skipgram. So we'll take a look quickly uh, on how they are done. So common bag of words is basically a model that uh, predicts the current word. Like I, I tried and highlighted some of the major areas that when you read the slides, you get the point of which is, which is it's that's trying to predict. So uh, con continuous bag of words predicts the current word given the contextual words within a specific window. So the input layer here is like, you know, con contains of all the context words. Like you say, you see weight of T minus two, where T is the final target word that we want to uh, map. But what we are doing here as in the input is like mapping the previous two words like T minus one and T minus two for the target word and also two uh, the next two words after the target word, which is T plus one and T plus two. So what we what it does is it kind of takes that uh, context words in the input layer and in the hidden layer contains all the number of dimensions in which we want to represent the current word. And the final word gives you the output of, uh, it's basically predicting that given these two words in front, and if you have a fill in the blanks, it's gonna be able to fill in the blanks correctly with the word from all the contextual dimensions it sees in the uh, model. So uh, it's also based on you know a window method, like window method is just a window size of how many uh, pre and post words you want to consider while uh, predicting this target. So here, if we say set to one, then it'll uh, refer to only one word from both sides of the target word and find that uh, uh, single stride from both its neighbor, like the first neighbor, like before and after neighbors. And it keeps changing depending on how much window size you want to provide. So this is a good example. Like if you look at this source text, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. The I highlighted it here in the, the next section that input layer is the white box content. You are passing on the all the, uh, in a whole sentence, apart from that particular word, all the other words, be it uh, in the first or the second half of the word gets into as the input layer. That's the white box content. And the target layer is the uh, blue word. And here window size is five because our whole sentence is of five uh, tokens. So we kept it as uh, like five. So this is uh, to predict one of that word using uh, continuous bag of words. So here basically it's trying to predict, like we mentioned all the, all the particular words with the context from the neighboring words and whichever you want to uh, put the limit as depends on which kind of sentences you have and what are the kinds of applications you want to do. Now, the another, the second part of it is like skip cramps. If you see the, uh, if you go back to the slides and see this structure, it's kind of opposite to what we were trying to do with CBW, like continuous bag of words. Skip grams is basically, uh, the only difference is instead of predicting the current word based on all the contextual word, it tries to maximize the classification of a word based on another word in the same sentence. So basically uh, you're saying that uh, here in this example, uh, if this is the whole sentence, 
then now you want to your input layer will only be the blue boxes like you'll have the quake and brown respectively and your target layer that you want to predict is the white box content it's like if if the if given the word the what's the uh, probability that a quick or what's the probability that brown will follow the word uh, the in there yeah so the basic idea of the whole uh, architecture of two different sets of architecture inside word embedding and word to vec is that to identify words that occur in similar con context and uh, so that we can assume that which words are you know closer to each other in the in the vector uh, vector space great so this is a great uh, like i'm going to show you in drill time like i'm quickly uh, shifting can you this is a, a embedding projector by tensorflow i would encourage you all to quickly go and uh, take a look uh, at and you can play around like i uh, searched the word politics here and uh, if you see that we are looking at 100 neighbor mm -hmm. words and uh, this is the list of all the neighboring words with their cosine distance mapped out here you can also look at the euclidean distance mapped out here uh, here you would see that you can you know run the tsne and uh, you can run uh, resume if you resume you can they're going to show how it looks in the whole vector space we're trying to like isolate some of the points and uh, if you want to put it together you pause it and then you see that politics is very closely related to you know economy intervention diplomacy military violence religion demographics all these words fall under you know a, a cool visualization of the uh, vector space for the particular world uh, politics and you can upload your own uh, vertebec model as well and uh, yeah great so yeah going back to the uh, session yeah i know it was like a a, a lot of content that we uh, rushed through uh, let's take uh, some time downtime here uh, the idea of this webinar is like you know to introduce you all to understand the theory concepts that's that's there in all the baseline nlp applications and tasks so even if you do not understand or it's not clear some of the concept like don't worry about it at all it definitely takes time uh, maybe uh, once we have the recordings up and running you can refer to the slides and then uh, like go to each of the source links and start and spend some time to understand it in depth and read uh, through some of the applications. But uh, I guess understanding the overall idea of Ortovec is very important in order to be, you know, in order to do any kind of NLP task, be it question answering or anything of that sort. Great. Uh, we'll take like uh, maybe <laughs> it takes a sip of water. I'm going to do that too. Great. So let's proceed. So next up is Stanford Glove. So you would uh, say that, okay, uh, you know, I had a uh, word to vec, it works amazingly to understand the context. So why do we need another methodology? So the reason is not for word to vecs performance, but basically the fundamentals of the solutions that it has. So remember we talked about that word to vec relies on like, you know, the local information of the text or the uh, corpus that you're passing, that is the semantics are learned by a particular given word by their affected surrounding words. So like, for example, in this, uh, as it says, the, the cat sat on the mat. The problem with using word to vec is that it wouldn't capture information like if, if we want to know that if the word, the a special context of the words, or, uh, uh, or it's like, uh, you know, uh, particular to that sentence that we are using, or it's just another sub, sub st another stop word basically. So uh, this can be suboptimal, especially uh, like the theor theoreticians mentioned that they do want to understand more in depth for some of the uh, languages. And that's why GLOVE came out from Stanford. And we'll see that what it's trying to do. So basically they said that you can derive semantic relationships between word from the co-occurrence metrics and not necessarily only the uh, only the surrounding words for a particular uh, text right or for or, part, or for a particular token so uh, so that's why it's called like a globe it's a it's about a global concept context and that's why glove stands for global vectors 
let's quickly uh, discuss through on how it is different uh, from what we did with word to -Ved. So yeah, as I mentioned, GLOVE stands for Global Vectors for Word Representation. It's definitely, uh, it's an unsupervised learning algorithm. It's developed by Stanford and uh, the word embeddings that were generated were done by aggregating global word to word co-occurrence matrix from a given corpus. So co-occurrence, what does that mean? So co-occurrence is like to map from the entire corpus history, how many times have you seen a particular word being utilized uh, with another uh, uh, word in the whole corpus that you had just passed through. So basically the statistics of word occurrences in the corpus is like the primary source of information for all unsupervised methods, right? Because learning the word representations, otherwise there is no way to understand uh, which context they're coming from. So the question still remains as to how to generate the, how or what, what's the exact way to create those meaningful vector representations. So if you see in the image here, it says that say consider you have like a word context matrix and you also have a, a word feature matrix. So basically word context matrix is uh, determined by the word feature matrix that you have and by multiplying those feature context matrix because those are mapped in a different uh, space when you utilize this model and then uh, you can uh, kind of sum it up and factorize it to get the uh, initial word context matrix together the word context matrix is then like you know it might have some loss functions like you would say that okay what if some of the words were uh, very rarely uh, occurred together but uh, but how do we know that we are not losing out on context if we remove them, right? Because it would get lesser scores. So then this method uses uh, stochastic gradient descent as the loss minimizing loss function. You can read it up later. It's definitely not uh, something that you have to know, but it's very good to know. So uh, you can refer to some of the links uh, later and read up uh, on those methodologies uh, during time uh, when you have when, when you like if it's interesting enough for you to go through each of these uh, documentation so for the process it's basically uh, you know a matrix factorization technique uh, it's trying to understand the relationship of each of these words by studying the ratio of their co-occurrences in the various probe words like say this word like in this example like let's say word k appears in the context of word w and consider a strong related word to ice, which is like, uh, it's definitely not steam, but solid, the word solid is definitely strongly related to ice. So then probability of uh, solid given the word ice would be relatively high. And then probability of solid given the word steam because they are not related will be kind of relatively low. So then the ratio of these two probabilities is gonna be large, which means that the word solid and ice is highly correlated and has occurred with a bigger number of co-occurrences uh, that we have seen in the uh, in the whole corpus uh, that you have passed now consider another example here like say the word gas that's related to steam right but not very strongly related to ice so then the ratio between uh, given the word ice of probability to have the word gas divided by uh, given the word steam uh, to have the probability of gas will be small and then uh, we can assume that uh, they are kind of not related great so you can uh, review some of these uh, you can refer to some the source link that's given in the slide and go through each of the explanations in detail and please get back to me as well if you have any doubts or you want any more classification uh, clarification on uh, how it's happening uh, we can discuss that in detail uh, later as well great so just to keep in mind that work to vec and glove models are you know kind of similar uh, in how they work both aim to build the neighbor like both the aim of both the models is to create that vector space that we have been talking about for so long, but uh, like how they do it is like kind of a difference. So for word to vec they find local individual examples for co-occurrence and for GLOVE, they do it a global aggregated co-occurrence statistics across all your corpus. To give you a little bit idea, we're not gonna go deep in Dr. Vec today, but now that you know the baseline understanding of uh, Word2Vec and Glove, Dr. Vec is just a one step up of it. 
So unlike words, documents do not come in logical structures, right? Like words will be uh, like we saw that how important it's to create, like have the word sentences as in a semantic and a structural way. But when you think about documents, it can be in any order. So the, this concept was given by Mikhailov and Lay, and when they said what they said is that they just added on top of word to vec model another vector, which is called the paragraph ID, which you can see highlighted as like you know the orange box in the image. Later, uh, this sketch might also seem familiar because it's a small extension to the continuous bag of words model that we just dis discussed a few minutes back. But instead of using just words to predict the next word, what they did was just they added another feature vector, which is document unique. So in that way, you are able to identify which words are belonging to which documents and how we can predict that if given a certain word, what's the probability that it might uh, you know, uh, exist in this document. So when we're training the word, say vectors, the document uh, vector D, uh, at the end of it, the how it fetches the memory from, it is called the distributed memory version of paragraph vector. These are very in-depth analysis of each of these document uh, to vector architecture. Please uh, do refer to the link and read up if, you, uh, if you're interested and you want to uh, dig deeper uh, in this section. Yeah, so yeah, that was like a, a big rundown of uh, word to vec and embeddings in general. And uh, why we did spend uh, quite some time in this section because uh, any task at hand for NLP utilizes some kinds of embedding and it's very crucial to understand which works best for us and how we can do it. So now we'll just quickly in a very overview way, uh, look at similarity scoring. Uh, we discussed this uh, in details last week, so I will not go uh, very deep into this, but we will see some hands-on uh, you know, work on how we can utilize uh, what, to, what to vec for document similarity and uh, sentence similarity. So yeah, this is just a method of, you know, you, when you have a question, you also have a corpus, you do all the pre-processing that we described, you do word embeddings, you have feature vectors, uh, and then you finally, you know, the output is a vector similarity. Another similarity metrics that sometimes helps when uh, we compare it with say uh, similarity metrics like cosine similarity is that uh, in cosine similarity what happens is that uh, if you have you know uh, like two sentences that have no common words sometimes the cosine distance will be zero right like and that's like a ter terrible distance score because two sentences have very similar meanings consider this two documents like obama speaks to the me media in illinois and the president greets the press in chicago both of them are kind of talking about the same thing, but none of the words match each other. So here, uh, word mover distance was like, you know, proposed as one of the value additions on top of cosine distances. So what they're saying is they're solving this problem by taking into account the word similarities in the word uh, embedding space, which cosine distance do not uh, consider. It just plain does it after you know tfidf and then uh, does a uh, uh, matching uh, of the words or the tokens that it finds so word mover basically uses the word embeddings of the words in two text and measure the minimum distance that the words have in one text that is like or the minimum distance it needs to travel from uh, travel to go to say chicago from illinois not like not uh, in a uh, practical or not in the literal uh, sense of the term, but uh, vector, you know, methodology to do this operation to see how far will the vector have to go from uh, Illinois to go to the word Chicago. And it shouldn't be too much because we saw that it's going to be clustered in a very similar space in the whole vector space model. So yeah, you can go through the slides. These are some of the ways you can uh, utilize or you know a combination of various pre-processing uh, embedding techniques. Uh, sometimes it gives different thresholds uh, based on the types of documents you have, and it helps uh, in you know, doing some kinds of rundown and tests. And the final would be something like this: uh, confusion matrix is nothing but just basically you know mapping uh, results into the table color and uh, coded by like similarity it, it portrays. Uh, for another area of it is question answering. So if you see question answering model, it's basically based on uh, you know providing relevant context based on the input questions and to give you a 
answer of how it can be done. So this is like a very simple workflow document and the application of it is here in like, you know, say a chat assistant, like, you know, the chat assistant, that how do I reset my password? The algorithm then takes it back, does all the embedding mapping, tries to find, you know, the similarity between previously answered questions and gets you the link of, you know, the top three similar saved questions that can answer your question. Uh, this is a very crucial and a useful implementation and how uh, some of it has been utilized in a lot of uh, industry applications. Similar to that is also something like information retrieval, like you have a context and you ask the question that when did Beyonce start becoming popular? So when we train it in a, in a way that we do in word to vec the idea is that the text in the late 90s that's highlighted in green is the exact answer to the question of the user and they can ask uh, and they can, uh, you know, it can give it back uh, uh, to the exact question that you have from the context. Uh, a context is basically the corpus that we pass to train the, uh, the the model. So all of these applications are a very everyday, very useful applications, and I personally work in some of those in my everyday day-to-day -day projects. So uh, for a fact, uh, word to vec is a boon. That's that's uh, like no change. Nothing can deter that, and it's like the baseline application of many uh, use cases. Great. Uh, so uh, we'll quickly take a look at what's the state of NLP today. Like if you see this chart, it like explains that uh, how rapid the growth have been in the last two years. And like just as in the recent as in May, uh, OpenAI re uh, released like a GPT-3, which has like 175 billion parameters. So the growth of NLP has been phenomenal. And that has like one of the factors that did like did this boom uh, is BERT. So I'm not gonna go too deep into BERT, but I wanted to like put this idea out for all of you to know that that's where we are going next. Now that we know embeddings, now that we have some of the idea about how these tasks work, what's next and what's the, what's the uh, you would say like the state of the art model that's uh, going in, uh, going in around the market that you can very well understand by understanding the base concepts of embeddings. Yeah, like uh, like we just said that this is some this is a concept that we learned in word embedding, uh, like representation in the vector space for multiple words gives gives very meaningful features, and word kind of utilizes that. Now this is a very great representation of Bert Mountain by Chris McCormick. And he says that you do, Bert is based on all these previous you know, concepts, but he says that you don't have to know all these previous concepts. You just have to understand the last, you know, the top two or three layers, and then you'll be good to go to implement and understand how, how the Berg architecture works. So very quickly, just to give you a highlight uh, about what the general idea of BERT is, it's nothing but just, you know, a transformer. Transformer is like you have an input, you have a, you have, so you remember in word to vec we had one hidden layer. In this case, it's multiple hidden layer and we are, it's not shallow anymore. It's deep because we have multiple hidden layer that gets uh, you know, summarized and uh, summed at the end to give you output, which is like the decoded values of H. In this case, it's very uh, easy to see that it's a big implementation uh, for machine translations, for uh, utilization of uh, question answering again, and transferring speech to text is also a big use case of here. Great, so uh, yeah, please go through some of these applications. Uh, the sources are there. There's a lot of good articles that describe but uh, no step by step, but there's one factor that that's, you know, the underlying of all the bird architecture is attention. There's a paper called Architect Attention is All You Need. Uh, please do read it if you are interested. But uh, the overall idea in this example, if you see this, there's this sentence called the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. Now the idea is how do we know that this it sentence refers to? So now there is a co-referential issue. It's re is it referring to the word street? or it refers to animal. So for us, it's very simple to see, uh, look and see that the animal was tired and hence it didn't cross the street. But when the model processes the word it, the attention mechanism that uh, is the underlying factor of bird kind of uh, allows it to associate it with animal more 
than any other word. And that's how we know that these two are the words that should be in, uh, in a sequence. And uh, th that's the self-attention that uh, allows us to understand that whole word. Great. So yeah, uh, BERT is the full form. Yeah, it's a big name, bidirectional encoder representation from transformers. So uh, if you uh, want to learn a little bit more about it, some of the documentations will definitely help. But it was trained in Wikipedia with almost 200 200,500 million words, wow. And uh, the architecture has a lot of hidden layers, uh, uh, attention heads, and 110 million uh, parameters. The best thing about BERT is that it's the first of its kind that created this deeply directional, I would say bi-directional. Now this bi-directional is very important because all these while, in this example, you would see that what I mean by bi-directional. In all the uh, previous, uh, models that we utilized, we were only considering, you know, either the first or the second. And each of those were happening not simultaneously. It was first we were passing one uh, word before our target word, like we did with continuous bag of words. Then in the second one, we also did uh, the second, uh, the later word in a second iteration. So those iterations were not happening together. So BERT is the first one that did this bi-directional representation all at once. So basically it's a, you know, creates this, if in, the, in this example, if you have, like you say, we went to the river bank and I need to go to the bank to make a deposit. Both of them have very different context and the differential word is river and deposit. So if you do it in a step-by-step -step iteration model using uh, some of the continuous bag of words or skip grams, it might not, might not capture it very clearly. But uh, using this uh, methodology of BERT, it, uh, it, it achieves that, uh, those uh, implications. Great, I just highlighted here some of the ways that uh, BERT tries to segment it. First, it has you know, a token-based, it, it is also sentence-based, and it's also position-based. So you see how deep that layer of BERT goes because it's trying to capture the context or the meaning based on which position in the sentence you are that word is in and which segment if it if it's some you know multi multi sentence phrase which sentence it belongs to and then of course there's like token based sentencing to understand its uh, particular uh, use cases so yeah please uh, go through some of the documentations if you're like and here's like a quick example of how bert helps uh, and how it was trained in two of these uh, tasks so that we can utilize it for any other prediction based tasks like we need the the strength of bidirectionality comes from masking a particular word like say the man went to the dash and he bought a dash of milk so how it was trained was to predict this word store and gallon respectively in the two sentences and why is it masked because that given a huge set of corpus BERT will not be able to, you know, kind of cheat and see that, okay, store and when to the store will definitely be in some other sentences, right? So that in order to keep that from the model from easily to understand uh, and predict it without doing the learning is why the masking thing has happened. And also like next sentence relationships, like if a sentence is the man went to the store and he bought a gallon of milk. The label is, it's its the next sentence. It makes sense contextually. But if the sentence is the penguins are flightless, yeah, that doesn't have any, uh, uh, any relation with the man went to the store. So the label would be non-next uh, non sentence. Uh, yeah. So yeah, the applications are all over uh, predictive analytics text everywhere. And uh, the more and more research that comes out it keeps getting better and in, more intuitive uh, rather than you know doing a lot of underlying manual uh, cleaning or classifications. Great, so uh, we looked at two different sets uh, of text representation. We also talk, spoke about a little bit of modeling, modeling which is like the word to vec uh, area and uh, how it's actually applying. So to wrap up the theory section, these are some of the overview of uh, things that we discussed today. And this is like kind of a core NLP stack that I feel we 
uh, kind of touched uh, upon uh, slightly over the last four weeks of sessions that we spoke about sentiments analysis. We also spoke about named entities, themes, topics, and how we do POS tagging, tokenization, chunking. So these are very uh, you know intuitive and each sub big subdomains as well. So you get to spend some time and when you get when you have some time spend like go through each of these sections uh, individually review some of the recordings from our previous uh, sessions and uh, you'll be able to understand it in a much better way uh, great so that was like a, a lot of talking so we the next session would be the uh, go to go through the collab uh, notebook and also take some of the questions that you might have had uh, but before that, we're going to quickly take a 10 minute break. So it's 4 p.m. EST time. We're going to be back in like 4.10 and uh, we'll take up the, uh, the Google Colab then. So yeah, get up, like take a, like, you know, drink water or coffee or wh whichever you like. And we'll be back in 10 minutes. Uh, thank you for joining and listening to so <laughs> listening to me talking so much and we'll do the course section at the next half of the session.
Great. Uh, hi, everyone. Hope you guys were able to take a quick break. Uh, took some coffee or tea, whichever you like. Uh, I also saw in the short chat that maybe uh, there was a little bit of interruption from my end. Yeah, there's like a, a, a work thing that's going on uh, next to my building. So I hope that was not too interruptive. Uh, if it was, please do note some of the points that you had and I can explain it to you later uh, after the session as well, if you have any other further questions. But yeah, uh, sorry about that. And uh, yeah, so we will start with the uh, next part of the session, which is like going through the whole collab notebook. Uh, Helena must have shared the link to the notebook uh, in the chat section and kindly refer to that. So uh, this is the Women Who Code Data Science Repository that uh, you have access to right now. So you can download the slides from here. Uh, like we showed last week, uh, you can easily uh, go to Google and do Google Colab. Uh, and the first link that comes up is the link that you would want to go. Uh, how do you read in the documentation or the GitHub code that you have uh, the link to? You click on the GitHub here. You copy the link of the GitHub code that Helena must have shared and uh, paste it right here. and then do a quick search. And then you would see that it'll pop up the whole collab notebook for all of you. Uh, were you guys able to connect to the GitHub repo? Sounds good, can we proceed? Please do ask if you have any other question or you want me to uh, go through that again. Great, so I guess, uh, great, thank you. So we will uh, go through this again uh, uh, on how you can upload the data. Uh, the whole documentation here kind of mentions that uh, how you can download the data set link. This is the same data set that we used for week two and week three, which is the news data set from Kaggle. Uh, you can visit this link, download the CSV file, which is article CSV. And uh, or I'm sure you must have the CSV already downloaded by now. If not, uh, you can follow these steps and you can upload into the left-hand section uh, of this document section here, upload to session storage and your uh, data will be here. Great, uh, so there's one more thing, uh, additional thing that we need to do for this section's uh, code is that we need to download the pre-trained Google News work to vec model. Uh, it might take a while, but this is the procedure to run it. You can utilize this command here. Uh, I run it here. It might take a, a, a few minutes, maybe not a few minutes, but a few long seconds, uh, and uh, it will load the section. This file is pretty big. It's almost, if you see here when I uh, loaded it, it's 1.5 gigabytes of zip file. So uh, yeah, you can run this command and uh, directly it's gonna put the whole model into the content section. Like we saw, you can see which folder the Colab notebook that you are in access to when you run the PWD uh, function and it will show you content uh, slash content. So uh, yeah, that's where it kind of saves or copies the model from the link, uh, which is hosted in uh, one of the S3 buckets in Amazon AWS. Great, so please do, uh, like I mentioned here, please do uh, ask any questions if you have any trouble loading this model in uh, hashtag NLP channel and uh, when you call data science Slack, uh, we, all of us is gonna be there and we'll try to sort the issue if you have any. So yeah, once you do an LS here, you would see that the articles file, uh, that uh, that's the Kaggle data set that we downloaded and the model is already loaded in the, uh, in the, in the section or in the data set here. So here we are uh, you know, they, like importing all the useful uh, uh, libraries that we need to utilize. One new addition here, sorry, is uh, pip install Jensen. So Jensen is basically the library that we are gonna be utilizing and using for all doctor uh, work to work operations. They are, have like a great tutorial. Like if you go down here, I have mentioned the Jensen documentation. If you click here, 
uh, and go to the section here, you will see a big uh, documentation on how to download pre-trained models. If you go to the document section, you would also be able to, you know, review some of the core tutorials that they have, that you can, how you can do topics and transformation using Jensen's uh, work to vec, how to do similarity queries. You can also look at Dr. Vec model here and some of the LDA model and distance metrics that uh, uh, that we discussed in last week's session is also here. Uh, another, if you have any questions, you can also visit their GitHub repo and kind of, you know, raise a issue request if you think that something is not working. But otherwise, it's a very well documented uh, uh, library and it says it's topic modeling for humans. It's very clear on what their end goal is. Great. So how do we do it now? So how do we load the model? So here, here's how you do it. So this is a variable that I'm initializing as like, you know, the path to uh, Google bin VEC. And this is the link that we have. That's where it's downloaded in our uh, Google Colab notebook. And keyed vectors is how is is what we have downloaded here. Uh, gens from Jensen models, you in, uh, import the keyed vectors. So basically, this is a way of importing all the vector space embeddings inside Jensen model without loading the full model because the full model is going to be a little bit bigger and you make the binary equal to true because yeah, it's different. It's a binary file. Uh, it's a bin file here. You can see dot bin. And then once you load it, it might take a couple of minutes to load in here as well. Uh, so yeah, uh, if we give the time to run it and then uh, you will see that the Google uh, news vector is loaded successfully. Uh, great. So now we want to explore this model that Google has already trained for us using, you know, a lot of news articles. So if we want to know how many vocab unique words are there in the model that we just loaded, we just run this function where it says that length of the model that we loaded in W2V uh, underscore model, which is the variable name dot vocab. It'll say that it has 3 million unique words in the vocabulary. So it's a pretty big uh, it's a pretty big corpus, and uh, yeah, and we'll see how uh, how we can refer to it more. So, like, say, if you want to uh, print, what are some of the words? Like, it's not necessarily, but just to you know, explore and see what are some of the words, like company, team, against, all these kinds of words. Like, I just I just printed out like you know twenty words from in the index from hundred to one twenty. You can play around and print out as many as you want. Here, another way to show you. This is just a small regex to show you that in the embedding model, there are also multi, multi word tokens. And in order to do that, I just did this small embedding, just kind of like trying to find uh, tokens that have an underscore uh, in them. So you see some of the examples that comes out is like say New York, United States. So that makes sense, right? So that's how we keep the context alive because otherwise if it was tokenized as two separate words, then New York wouldn't be New York uh, as is and uh, it, it will not make much sense. Yeah, so you can play around and see what are the other kinds of uh, multi-word uh, is available in the model as well. You can just change the count here. So I'm just calling the first 2000 tokens. And within that, you can play around and change the count and uh, look at it in a deeper section later. So how does the vector space actually look like within the model? So this is how you can call it. So like say vec car is a variable, which is calling the our model that we have just loaded and calling the word car into it and want to see what is the array or what's the vectorial representation of this word in the vector space. And as you can see, this is like, you know, whole array of uh, multidimensional uh, representation that it must it have found in the corpus of the training context and then have mapped it in, in this way. But you would say, okay, I this is great, but it's not very helpful. It's not helpful for like, you know, human eye to look at it in this way. But uh, let's see what we can do in, uh, utilizing this model uh, in the next steps. So uh, before we go into that, another thing I would like to mention is that that word to vec cannot handle OOV words, which is like out of vocabulary words, which is not present in the, uh, the training corpus when the model was created or embedded. So like say a word like Cameroon or a word like Brexit. So I put it under a try except catch and send that, oh, if it's a key error, it'll print that the word Cameroon does not appear in this model. So that means when the model was trained, the word Brexit was not yet uh, like, you know, a thing. So that's why it didn't find it. And uh, that's why sometimes we need to uh, you know, keep training our models if there's like a newer data set or newer 
sections of data and particularly if it's a very niche or specific use case like say a biomedical research has happened and new terminologies new words new medicines have come up and you want to include that in your biomedical uh, word to vec that you have trained using prior medical data so you have to you can kind of uh, add on and build on top of the baseline model to include those words but yeah, it's it's, uh, it's it's pretty great otherwise. So here, let's take a look at it, how it handles similarity. So like say, uh, I have a, a dictionary here uh, called pairs and I have paired a few couple of words just to show. And then it calls the similarity function and then gives you an output that car and minivan has like, you know, a similarity score of 0.691. That's how it's being placed in the, uh, uh, what, uh, this this base models vector space and uh, you would see that car and serial has like 0.1 it means basically that it doesn't have any co contextual reference but maybe sometimes a sentence must have come oh I, I was going in a car while eating my cereal that can come right like so that's where it might have found that little relevance in the document set in the, the training phase. And that's how the, that's why the small uh, referential point rather than that bicycle airplane are like 0.5 because they're also mode of transport, but not necessarily, you know, a car. So now we'll see like how you can print, like, you know, the most similar. So most similar is a, a, a method that you're calling from the function. And you're saying that this is what I was mentioning in the theory section as well, that you can pass positive reaffirmation words, like you want to find words that are related to car and minivan and top end is like you want to find the top 10 words in that whole uh, referential model. So then you see that SUV, vehicle, pickup truck, Jeep, sedan, all these definitely make sense. Taurus, Nissan, Ultima comes up with uh, varying degrees of uh, similarity score here next to it. So, but they are almost everything is like, I guess, above 0.7. So that means they're very positively related and has occurred in the space a, long, a lot of times when the corpus was trained. If you say, if you do not want to like pass any positive word and just want to know what's most similar to the word car, then yeah, some you would see some overlap from the two of these uh, sections, but there's vehicle, there's car, there's also some other uh, like truck came up, which didn't come in the first one where we had a positive information of minivan, because truck is definitely not a minivan, but it did come up when we are only, you know, kind of broadening our search and not looking uh, into minivan as uh, in the specific terms of it. So the, this are, these are some of the other examples that I just wanted to highlight. You can play around with any word that you might have had and then see how it changes. So here I'm trying to look at most similar and the positive words here are king and royal. So you would see that monarch, royals, queen, princess, king, monarchy, sultan, everything came up, which kind of is all uh, represents the same idea of royalty and uh, from that terms sense of it. So yeah, you can run through some of these other examples I tested and you can uh, look at it uh, and explore it more. But if you also want to say like, okay, now I know what's similar, but I also want to know what doesn't match. Like if you have say a string of list and you have like uh, uh, a lot of tokens and you want to understand what doesn't match with each other in the contextual form, you just call the model and you call this method called doesn't match and pass that uh, list uh, with all the strings. Here I have fire, water, uh, land, sea, air, and car. And you would see that then car becomes something that doesn't match or that's like, you know, the odd one out from the whole section of uh, the doc that you are passing. Another example here, uh, these are all, you know, royal uh, in the royal context. And then you see that farmer is presented as doesn't match from the other contextual references uh, words. You can also, you know, uh, do a similarity score between sequence of words. And here we were utilizing most similar if we have one particular token or term. In this case, uh, you can do n similarity. So this is basically you pass, say, two sentences. It can be two big sentences. It'll give you the similarity score between this string, which is sushi and store, and this list of strings, which is Japanese and restaurant. And you get like you know a similarity score of 0.6, which is pretty good and gives you the idea that 
they are like kind of uh, similar not necessarily all japanese stores are sushi stores so that's why the you know the penalty or the minus marks because japanese restaurants have much more or other closer terms than sushi and store that we <coughs> saw how we can get from the this this most similar format here great so another example is yeah just to give you multiple folds of understanding of how you can utilize it you can also utilize this method called most similar to given now say if you want to find that okay there is a list of tokens and i want to only identify which one refers to the word that i have that i want to refer to like in this list you have buddhist fuji sushi and tea but you want to only find the most similar that is similar to the word food so then you would see that sushi would come out uh, as like you know the the word that you want to extract from the whole sentences it can be like as big a sentence uh, or as big a token list of sentence that you uh, might have and you can utilize this function in this way great so yeah if you like say so now i already had like you know broken out tokens here if you have like you know sentences like this sent where sentence was is like the room is dirty and you have like another sentence called disgusting dirty dorm so you can pass the end similarity again here what you need to do first is like make sure everything is in lower case and you split it so then it becomes in a tokenized format like this and you basically pass those as a list uh, entry into the or as an argument in the end similarity method here and you would get the okay the similarity score between s1 and s2 is 0.59 so uh, so here so n similarity the base of n similarity is basically cosine similarity scores so here i wanted to do a quick uh, difference between how cosine and work mover similarity works like say for this example where we say that uh, you know obama speaks to the media in illinois uh, sometimes it happens that like when we try to calculate the cosine similarity the words may or may not be exactly similar in this case because we are utilizing word to vex cosine similarity because it's mapping it back from the vector space that has already been placed so words like speaks and greets will be together that's why you see that 0.63 is a good score compared to if you want to do a uh, cosine similarity using tfidf that would be disastrous and would give you like almost zero score which we discussed in the uh, the theory section as well but in this term but but in this context you can also utilize word mover score so you basically call this dot wm distance instead of n similarity and pass the in the same way uh, uh the the two of the sentences that we just uh, cleaned up the stop words from and like you know kind of split it and then you, know, you would see that it gives you a score of 1.01 so the concept of uh, word mover is that if it's a great match it'll be closer the value would be closer to 1 the further you go from each of the uh, sentences like say if you have another sentence here you can test it on your own time and see how the scores change if you have say another sentence here that oh, i love oranges or something like that then you would see that the score has moved much farther away from point 1 which means that it's not similar so it helps it in uh, those terms so this is uh, the plot that we saw in the uh, theory section as well so here i wanted to utilize the google word to vex to see that what kinds of words exist in the whole documentation this is uh, basically we are calling similar by word methodology for the word that you are going to pass we will see we are passing here the word car and we'll see how that works so uh, it's finding the close words it's appending all the words and basically plotting it and you can call the tsne function from sklearns library uh, we discussed it a little bit in uh, week 1 on uh, the use cases of sklearn and it's a great great library and has uh, many useful methods that you can refer to and basically plotting the figure to see that which words like and another point here i wanted to mention you can go through the code please ask me if you have any questions in details later like you see that n components equal to n here so n is the component that we are trying to pass that are, do we want it in a 2d or a three layer vector uh, format so here i pass like a value 2 for the word car and refer to the model word to vec so that goes into this function that we created here display closest word uh, tsne scatter plot so it's feeding in the word to vec as the model value 
word that we want to find the similar values and plot is the car and n components is two which is like a 2d vector basically and uh, just creating you know the coordinates so this is what comes up you would see that uh, the fourth focus like we saw and above is like you know represented in a good way now you would say that it's all over the place where is the cluster so let's try by utilizing three uh, uh, 3d vector here you get like you know a, a bit more closer intuition on how the uh, the vector space clusters look like like you see honda civic is like far apart and why is that because you if you look at this cluster over here in the middle you see suv truck jeep minivan these are like kind of like bigger vehicles in terms of how it has been utilized but honda civic is like a particular name of the brand of a car and that's why it do not fit into the exact connotation of it of it is but it's it's there it's definitely in the same line or the domain that it comes from but it's a name of a particular car and not necessarily what we're talking about here is like pickup truck or the kinds of uh, truck not particularly a name uh, so I, I tried with I tried it with another uh, call like you know said tasty you can call tasty you will see delectable scrumptious delicious flavorful all kinds of different uh, like similar words that uh, comes into this uh, closet in this model and I tried it with another soccer you would see soccer basketball football volleyball so yeah basically showing you the representation of all the top ten words I guess top ten yeah top ten words into uh, that's closest to this word that we saw in a 2D vector space. Great. So we saw that now, till now we were utilizing the model that we downloaded from Google's word to vec directly, and we didn't pass any, uh, you know, our own data. But now that we know how to explore it, let's like, you know, kind of fit our data into the pre-trained uh, Google uh, word to vec model and see that how, how it can help us in, getting some of the uh, indexes or matrices that we want to uh, create. So in the same way, like we did for the last two sessions, we are utilizing the same data. We are loading the CSV into Pandas data frame. Uh, we, last week we included some cleanup methodologies. Like we saw uh, there might be some, uh, you know, bad data when you're downloading from the uh, Kaggle data set. So this is just a way to clean it up. So you're calling the Python function, you're loading it into the CSV using these calls that have been mentioned here because the data set. Also before that, uh, when you download the data from the Kaggle, do not like make sure that you rename the first column, the un unnamed column as num, so that we can utilize that column in the later part to clean up if there is any row that uh, do not have this num value as integer value and uh, clean that up as like, you know, a bad file or a bad row. So here we're just cleaning up, we're seeing what are the rows and number of uh, columns that we have. So for the sake of simplicity, I did not read the full file because like I was kind of running out of uh, RAM disk, but you can do it at your own pace. And I just called in the first 5,000 rows uh, here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so yeah, basically uh, you remove any empty rows if you have, you're calling access zero, drop any NA rows and how is basically saying all empty rows and you in place means true that your uh, data frame will be reloaded with all uh, non-empty rows. Uh, and it says that, okay, our file was pretty clean, no worries and everything is in order. So here is what I mentioned earlier that we are utilizing that uh, column that you renamed from the file you downloaded from Kaggle as num because we check that if it's not a numeric uh, uh, column, we coerce it and say that this is an error file and we kind of uh, replace it. So uh, all the bad files that we do not have this column as row 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And if there's like, you know, any text spillover that sometimes happen from multiple, uh, because these consist of big texts in each of these cells. So it might slip over. So we're just cleaning it up so that there is no reading or error values. Great. Uh, I hope that helps. Like, please do ask if you have any questions and we can go over that again later. So here you are describing the data as we did earlier. We are doing df.info, seeing if they are the count, if they are non-null type and what's their uh, D type. And we see that we have float, uh, three float type objects, two in type objects and five uh, objects, which is like basically text. 
and we're also doing a sum to see if there is any null values not in any of the columns that we would uh, utilize uh, which is like you know the title column and so we just gonna go forward without doing any changes at this stage so uh, this is some of the uh, libraries that you might need like stop words and punct from nltk corpus we'll see how you how we utilize it but you can run it like this and import the word tokenize which we definitely need in order to tokenize the uh, the data set that we are really dealing with. So here uh, we're creating a new data frame called title DF because we are only utilizing the title column from this big, uh, big corpus of data set that we have. Uh, if you want, you can test it out on the content section, the author section, and see how it changes and uh, how how you can you know find more insight utilizing the same same method. So these are some of the uh, you know sample files how the titles look like, uh, utilizing all the concepts that we learned in week one, week two, uh, and even week three. This is how you were uh, doing all the noise cleaning. You, you're using lowercase. This is how you're lowercasing it, and then using a regex here to you know kind of clean uh, all the spacing, special characters, uh, and such things uh, from our uh, from our column here title. So, and then we do a quick word tokenize. We apply word tokenize, which we downloaded uh, from NLTK Corpus. And uh, we have like another column right now here, which is like the tokenized format of the title. So uh, let's look at what data we have right now. So I did this section, the checking for all the non-stop word lists to see if there are some words that's been mentioned too many times to the title that we might need to remove or might need to consider to add to our general stop word list because sometimes what happened is consider that you have two titles and both the titles have uh, New York Times, New York Times a lot of times. Then when you do a cosine similarity score between those two titles, the the uh, you know the the reason that the because the New York Times was mentioned in both the two sentences the cosine score will come up to be too high and kind of like negate the actual value of similarity that we are trying to achieve here. So that's why I wanted to plot it quickly in the, this is the same as we did it in week two as well as week three. So you can just run it, text through it, do a count uh, of the whole corpus, find out the most common words and then chart it out. So we find that bright part and New York, you see here, New York Times, it's split here, but it's basically referring to the New York Times that's been constantly mentioned in the uh, in the titles uh, as such, because they are titles and they want to re reflect which uh, brand it's coming from or which publication it's coming from when a user sees it. So in this method, uh, what we are trying to do is this, this whole chunk of code, we'll go step by step, but basically at the end of it, we're calculating the similarity uh, between the title DFs that we are passing. Before that, let's go here. Like say in the input section, there's two files. Like we send a batch of 10 titles uh, in this document batch one and another random batch of 10 titles in this documents batch two. So how we are, how we are doing it, we're basically just calling the title uh, DF title that we had. We are calling sample 10. And we are just checking just for the sake of, you know, to make sure that there is no error, that there is no null values or there is no empty rows. And then we are checking what's the length of it. We will see uh, as we go down, the length would be like 10. Similar for batch 10, but I have utilized the random state here, nine. So just to make sure that not the same uh, titles come in both the sections. So the random state five and random state nine will have different, uh, different sets of titles that we need to work with. So here, um, let's start from the main function here. What we are doing here is like we are calling a similarity matrix by passing the title DF that the uh, that we have chosen and the work to vec model that we downloaded from the Google pre-trained uh, uh, work to vec model. And here we are also passing a word called stop. Now you see that I created a, a stop word set here like the, this stop is like the original stop word set from the English that we're downloading. But I also added a frequent words title called Breitbart, CNN, and New York Times that we saw in the image above that they were very prevalent in the title section. And I appended, I basically extended it in, into the list of stop words 
to ensure that uh, now that the stop, if you print out, I, I chose it not to print it out, uh, but if you print out the stop word set, you will see that now these, these list of words were also added into stop words. And this is how you can, you know, kind of add your own niche uh, stop words if you're dealing with any particular set of data that you know, like in legal, legal data set, there is so much stop words that you might need to remove that keeps on coming in all documents, but do not have any uh, you know, underlying value to the context. Mm -hmm. So here we are calling the, uh, you know, again, turning, making the sentence into lower, uh, just checking uh, if it's not available, if it's not in stop words, then the sentence goes and then calls, call, and then calling it in the word to vec model. So basically we are fetching the vector representation of this word W which is like one of the word in the sentence in our title. Uh, you saw that when we called uh, this function uh, up above, I'll just refer to it quickly so that it comes up in the memory here. So if you're calling a model with a word, a particular word like a car, this is the output value that the algorithm is calling and receiving from this uh, method call. So it's getting all the full vector representation of the word, and then it's gonna you do all the cosine, uh, similarity scores and word to vec scores at the end of it to go down quickly and where we were. Uh, yep, sorry for that. I just wanted to ensure that we all know what it's what the value that it looks like. Yeah, and then we are creating this vector set by appending each of the words vector representation into this thing called vector set. Now we are passing, now there's another function here where it's, uh, you know, kind of calculating the cosine similarity and checking that and just doing it in a very clear, uh, dot product and uh, the formula is very uh, simple and you can look it up and it just uh, gives you that cosine similarity score value for sentence vector one and sentence vector two which is like two of the uh, list of the documents that we had passed the output of it if you go down and review some of it it'll be like say the number of title documents of one that we passed to it is 10 Ti number of title documents two is 10 the matrix length would be 10, 100, right? Because we are comparing each of these 10 sentences or 10 titles against each of these 10 titles. So that's why the final outcome is 100. I also have created this uh, code text snippet here, which I uh, hashed it out, but you can uh, unhash it and actually save the matrix in a CSV file so that you can look it up and how it actually looks and which title uh, has scored maximum amount of uh, similarity score versus each title. So. I'm just gonna review the first, the maximum and the minimum uh, score here. Uh, but uh, you can print the document out and then review it at your own pace later on. So if you see that the maximum word vec similarity uh, was 0 0.64 <clears throat> uh, within the, uh, the, the 10, 10 documents that you passed uh, as like uh, in the title document sets and the news text two news texts that score the maximum uh, similarity score is this, which talks about, you know, GOP congressman says that needs to, you know, hit after Hitler comments. So basically a political uh, a news article that's talking about, you know, congressman and uh, something that's going on in the, uh, in the, in the US politics and also Hillary Clinton campaigns, amendment comments as threat and things like that. So you would see that the, the word bright word comes in here, but because we added it to the stop words in our section before, it was not considered while creating the, uh, the similarity score. So th that's a good thing for uh, some of the use cases that you might have had. And the one that has like the minimum word to vec similarity score is like 0 0.07. So it's like very, very dissimilar. So we see that the new, uh, which are the two titles that uh, scored that one was like, you know, Orlando Kahneman visited club on night of attack. So this is basically a, a, a situation that has happened and talks about, you know, an attack that have happened in Orlando. And the second news article talks about, you know, you increase the Brexit bill demand from 10 billion to 60 billion, which is like in a completely different context uh, from another country and talking about a different uh, contextual, in like a bill rather than, you know, an attack. So those are, that's why it being scored so less because they are like far from each other from the meaning that they're trying to portray. Yeah, so please do print, I would uh, encourage you all to print this out and save the results in the left-hand side panel here. You can download it like by clicking here and you can say, 
uh, oh, the download option doesn't come in the sample data, but when you save this file, uh, the name of the file would be this, but to VEC new SIM, and you can just click uh, here in the three dots and you would see a download option here, and you can download that data from there and see it in, uh, in a CSV or an Excel. Great, so another thing I wanted to highlight, like the, the term, the, the, the uh, representation that we did for the word, uh, how it looks utilizing our data and not the only data from the model itself. So let's just visualize the similar words using the TSNE format from the Kaggle data set that we downloaded. And here I'm creating like a variable which is called the similar words. And what it is doing is it's calling the most similar words from that model, which is already our pre-trained model. And it's searching for the terms and the top five terms. So, and these terms I'm then passing as in a list comprehension format saying that search terms in this list. So basically it's looking for in the first iteration as campaign, second iteration as funds, second iteration, a third as Clinton and so on. And when you print this, uh, the, the value of this variable out, it shows us like this, that campaign uh, found campaigns campaign. So you see there's like an underline to it and there's like, you know, some spelling errors, campaign campaign. So I wanted to highlight it to, to you all that it's very important to create a data set that's uh, not that that the spell errors have been fixed the the some of these issues that have underlying text has been fixed because sometimes when you just train it on you know uncleaned or different formats of uh, plain text it might it be, and for a fact that this has come here means that it has been used with the word campaign a lot of times in the article which makes sense but maybe the author by mistake you know, did a spelling error, and that's why it's still aligned together, but it's of different, it doesn't mean anything. This is, there is no word called campaign, or maybe there is, which I do not know, but uh, for this case, I know that there is not. But uh, yeah, so that's like one highlight of the whole uh, training method uh, requirements that we spoke in week one and week two as well. And here, Clinton, you see that Obama, McCain, Hillary, Barack Obama, so these are all the names that have come across alongside Clinton's name and then uh, so on. So now we want to you know, map it and see in the similar TSNE format from sklearn of how it looks in a 2D vector. So uh, I called you know, two components, which is like a 2D vector. And now see, you, you can see like, the clusters of together. So this cluster is called the fund cluster. So you'd see fund, money, money, funding, funds, these are all together here. Then there is another block, which is like election, election, election here for the election uh, block of uh, words. And then there is Obama, Obama here. There's also campaign, campaign altogether here. And then the another section was, I guess, the word gunman, which had like, you know, silent gunman, shooting rampage, those word blocks together at, as one in the vectors, 2D vector space for our easier understanding. Yeah, you can play around with it, like make it three, make change the word and see how it changes your uh, applications. So I wouldn't go too deep uh, using Spacey, but I just wanted to uh, like uh, using Glove, but I wanted to show you that how you can utilize the Spacey features uh, by uh, and call the Glove features for the model that we have right now or the Kaggle data set. So you can just pip install Spacey in a similar way. And in the previous sections we were downloading, if you remember, Encore Web SM, which were helping us, you know, utilizing all the POS tagging sections and chunking sections. But in this case, we'll be downloading this, which is like the N vectors web LG file. So it, it let it download, it might take a few time. And at the end, it shows that you can now load the model via spacey dot uh, uh, load N vectors web LG. So that's what we did here. Another quick thing I mentioned here is that once you download this file from spacey, you might, you might, I'm not sure if you have to, but you might need to restart your runtime because uh, it needs to somehow reload it in order to fetch it or see that it exists in the folder. So how you can restart runtime is like, you just go to runtime and you say restart runtime. You may lose some of your uh, previous uh, values or variables. So might need to rerun loading the data into the CSV file once again, but, uh, but yeah, that's how you can do it. So here we'll see that uh, what the n vectors in the space see how many words they have. So this is the total number of word vectors that's available within the word. If you want to find unique words, that's I wanted to showcase that 
uh, in the say the top title in the top 100 title uh, from our data set that we were using from Kaggle, what are the words that glove uh, or the species glove vector model found from uh, from it. So how you can call it is that you can just, uh, you know, call, call the word vector, set it into the NLP, which is the model that we loaded uh, in vector where will be, and you pass it as the unique words. And then uh, the when you map it into a data frame, you would see something like this, that these are the words works may throttled news trump toll invaded findings these are all the unique words that it found and uh, you know parameterized using the species for uh, club uh, methodology so yeah so this chart here looks wow it's too too many words together i want i and i only utilize you know the top 10 titles but it basically shows you in the same way that we did before that uh, what are the clusters if you want to know and uh, how you can utilize that word so here this is the this is the main area where you are calling the uh fit transform function from tsne and you're saying that okay hey i have this word glove vectors fit it into the tsne mode and then uh, uh show me what are the unique words and label it into the story vector so i just created like you know small you can color it as you want like change the edge colors of however you want it and then have the xy labels uh, holder so you can see that some of the words like auto misses and holder in the first 10 titles it didn't find any other similar domains but if you see in this chunk like it's kind of hard to see but you see here that airport railway is like mapped and mashed together because it's definitely falling into the same uh, zone you also see here uh, i thought that i saw that yeah shooting and uh, you know, there are some other inauguration and then here is treasure. So this is a very good way to represent some features, but not necessarily all the features. Like you can see here, it can get messy uh, because it's only a 2D vector space and all these words may or may not be in the same vector space. So that's why it kind of overlaps. But in the ideal situation of how the embedding vector space works, it's a multi multi vector multi dimensional vector and that's why uh, it's kind of hard to represent it in a in a 2d space so you can utilize like we discussed before the embedding projector and maybe upload your you know you can load your data set here load your the data that we uh, downloaded from kaggle here and you know utilize some words and see how it looks and maps in a much better format in this in this uh, in this format uh, and uh, not necessarily print out, sorry, not necessarily print it out in the 2D space. Another quick thing I just wanted to highlight, you may or may not do it, but then you can also create, you know, kind of a k-means that we discussed above, like a clustering utilizing uh, glove vectors. So here I'm calling and I'm saying that, okay, I want three clusters from the top 100 title uh, that I'm passing as the data set. And uh, the labels, when you print it out, will sh show something like this. I can see, like, you can see three clusters here, zero, one, two. When you run it, you can, like, you know, run step by step so that you can see each of these, uh, what what's the title is and if the cluster labels make sense. But in an overall hierarchical, like, overall view, you can see that this talks about, you know, how's Republicans fret, so it's number one. But the number two, this has, you know, among deaths, heavy toll in pop music. So it's basically a different uh, contextual news and not necessarily talking about political news of House Republicans. And that's why it was tagged into uh, two. There's, there's multiple way on how you can uh, decide on this uh, in clusters. Uh, we discussed a little bit time, a uh, little bit of it uh, last week. So please review the recordings as well. And also you can look up, uh, there's a lot, lot of documentation on k-means and how to refer on how to end up into the k-means, uh, the clusters that we want to identify, uh, and you will be able to, to go. So I referenced uh, quite a lot of, there's a whole lot of uh, applications as there. You can find some of these tutorials. I would uh, encourage you all to refer to this Jensen's documentation, where they basically talk about all the word to vec models, how you can upload, how you can review bag of words, how you can uh, utilize uh, some of these words, and how you can train your model. So this is the one thing that I wanted to highlight at the end. 
if you if you have like a like a, uh, for for me i had a lot of for a project a lot of uh, legal and uh, patent data so we the, we couldn't utilize the google uh, news vector which is like you know very common and it did, it was just not good enough for our use case so we had to create our own model and this is how you can uh, very easily create a model or if you want you know kind of rebuild on top of it you can also uh, do it as a, like you have a base model and you would just want to keep adding words and context you can pass uh, many uh, in, in different formats uh, and all these are here in the documentation you can just go through it and uh, go go through it step by step so that you understand the base and then you see how you can apply uh, to it great so please follow these references and i'm uh, pretty sure it'll help you out in understanding the whole method that we just discussed in a big way uh, great. So that was uh, uh, the session for today. Uh, I, we went through the, some a couple of theory and a couple of the code. Here's some of the other links I also found would be useful if you want to learn more about Word2Vec or uh, you know how Word2Vec uh, is like applied for predicting if an article will be successful or not. These are very good use cases. So you can look at them and then uh, uh, take uh, like take a deep read uh, on that. So if you, uh, thank you for joining today. If you have any questions, please join uh, Women Who Code Data Sciences Slack channel and you can uh, get into uh, hashtag uh, help me channel. And uh, also feel free to join our session next week. We're gonna be running a full end-to-end -end model building a supervised text classification model. And I hope you all will like utilize, like utilizing all the theory and code that we, uh, covered in section week one, two, and three, and four. Uh, we're going to be implementing end-to-end uh, -end, uh, build on week five. Great. So I'll just stop here and I'll see if I can answer some of the questions that uh, you had. Let me just pause my screen and open up the chat. If uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah. So I uh, the can you find numeric strings and associate it as bank account or identify it employee ID in any of these NLP systems? Yeah, so that's a good question. So here, what you're talking about is like if you have say you know uh, uh, tagged or labeled or annotated data. Like for us, for the legal data or the patent data, we had the tags that talk spoke about which. A particular industry that patent relies to. So you can definitely utilize uh, it as a tag and then uh, create, uh, you know, a model. But I guess in that, in those terminologies, word to vec will not work in a way because word to vec is like an unsupervised model and it's trying to learn from the text itself. So maybe look into doc to vec that can also help you in how you categorize uh, some of these words and label them internally. You can also include some of the methods that we discussed in the previous sections in uh, sp using spacey models, NER extraction. So that will also help you, you know, kind of tag and annotate and uh, keep it uh, as a separate when you're trying to like, train the model. Great, uh, uh, I see that, uh, could I mix the words could I mix the words from all the clusters to see if there are relationships between them? Could I mix the words? Okay, so you are saying that if you have like say two different uh, data sets and, uh, uh, and you have like different clusters and you want to check if there are similar clusters within those two data sets, I guess, yeah, definitely that will work. Uh, you can uh, like get the cluster like in, in the last section, you saw that how it comes up as a cluster in a different uh, column and take that out and then like, you know, analyze cluster cluster from two, from two of the different uh, data sets that you considered with and see that what are the you know, kinds of similar words from there. You can also do a cosine from say cluster one from data set one and cluster one from data set two. How many similarity scores or what are the major common terms that you can find? I guess that's going to be a useful implementation of that as well. Yeah, yeah it'll give you a lot of uh, idea. Uh, great, thank you for asking that, uh, Sulma. Uh, there is, can you share that? Uh, there's one question, can you share one good link to use word to vec in sentiment analysis? I guess, yeah, there is a, a lot of implementation. If you, we will try and, uh, I'll try and look it up and share a, 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 a good 
thing in the Slack channel later. But I guess if you just Google, you'll also find some very good resources that will come up in that uh, thing. Uh, there was one more question. I said, can I use BERT or another algorithm aside from Spaces to do NER tagging? I guess uh, I guess you could, but BERT is something that's too big right now. That's why you would see that a lot of big companies like let's say Google and they are using it mostly for research and for productionizing it because it's so big and it's trained on so many parameters. It is slow. It will give you, you know, state of the art results, but it's of no use if you can't like in an actual data science production lifecycle implement it. So that's why you would see that BERT Lite, Roberta, there are, these are some of these spin-offs that coming from BERT just to make that model smaller, easy to digest in terms of industry use cases and uh, uh, how, how efficiently we can do that without losing much of the, you know, the, the, the actual scores or the accuracy values. So I guess you could try that out, but uh, I would say that Spacey for the NER tagging is the market leader right now. And uh, that's easy to implement as well from the production point of view. Great. Uh, I see that is there an, uh, Yashika asked that is there an advantage using more access rather than just two? Yeah, so in this uh, TSNE method, you can only plot till 3D, so you can make it either two or three. Uh, other than that, it gets difficult to plot it out into a, like in a collab notebook. So what you can do instead of that, that's why I shared the embedding projector. It gives you, you know, kind of a circular idea about uh, even though if it's in a 3D vector, but it still shows you what lies where so that you have like, you know, more understanding that two words, they may seem similar, but in the vector space, they are still a little far. Like we saw uh, uh, with the case of, you know, the car, name of the cars versus the types of the cars like Jeep and et cetera. Uh, great. Uh, uh, can we rip, can, uh, uh, sorry, can we use TSNA to visualize similar words and also to replace all those misspelled words with the one they related to, to the correct word? I, I guess you could do that, uh, but TSNA uh, would be, you know, it's very difficult to map all the words that you have. So the best would be to go step by step first, try and clean like we showed some of the approaches uh, in week two and week three on how you could uh, do week one and week two, sorry, and how you could do that. So maybe start from there, uh, make sure that most of them are clean. And if there are any, uh, you know, uh, outliers that are still available or still exist in the data set, maybe you can plot it in this way and see that, oh, the, these two words are, you know, uh, same vector space, but it's spelled wrong. So then fix it in that way. But uh, yeah, uh, but start with fixing it from the first so that you don't have too many at hand to fix. Uh, great, I guess. Uh, is Doctorback open source? Yeah, every, yeah. all these methodologies are open source. You can download their models and you can utilize their uh, uh, use cases. They have a lot of good tutorials as well. So it's, it's great. It's great that they have all those open source. It makes life's, life easier for all of us. So it's like using it in a day-to-day -day basis for all our work. Great. Uh, uh, if you uh, another question uh, from Maria is like, if you want to classify products using product name, has sense of use Jensen? Um, if you want to classify products using product name, sense of use Jensen. Sorry, I could I didn't get the question very clearly, but uh, I, I guess you're trying to say if you want to classify the products uh, based on or utilizing the uh, library Jensen from if it's an unsupervised task and you have say a lot of uh, chat, say you have a lot of chat data that people have uh, raised requests of and each of them talks about different uh, products or some of them talks about the same product, you can utilize it to create like, you know, a, a vector space model or a word to vec model to see that which, uh, to find out the clusters of uh, the names of the products that were utilized or that were asked uh, in, the, in the whole data set. I hope that answers your question. If not, please do feel free to ask in the helping channel or the NLP channel and uh, we'll be able to help you. The last question I see here is, uh, I would like to know how to test which method is uh, glove or Dr. Beck is best, best for your case. For example, if you have different kind of features, should be an empirical decision. Yeah, so like like I mentioned before, like it's uh, a lot of it is used to get, like your use case based one. So word to vec work, works best with unsupervised and no unlabeled data. 
if you have you know big documents uh, like legal documents and you have some kinds of tags attached to it it you can utilize doctorvec for that so basically at the end of the day the uh, what do you call the the end goal is for you to understand what's the final answer or the final uh, value you want to get from your data and then choose the data set securely but if you search uh, different between vertivec versus glove uh, versus doctivec there are a lot of comparison sections as well and i hope some of the sections that we shared uh, in the theory section as well ha will help you understand that but yeah maybe uh, take like a deeper look into each of these methods to understand how they differ and that way you will be able to see which fits your data and your purpose the best uh, and uh, and that, that, that'll be it. Great. So uh, I guess we covered all the questions as well. Uh, this is a session for today. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, please feel, please join our, uh, the next session and where we will go through the end to end model building. If you have any further question, please ask uh, in the uh, hashtag NLP and hashtag help me channel and uh, what we call the data science slack. And, uh, and thank you everyone for joining for spending your Saturday uh, afternoon, even, evening, or night, based on your time zone with us. Uh, I hope it was uh, a learning, good learning session for you all, and uh, uh, happy learning. That's that's all I could say. Thank you, everyone.